runcast. I'm sorry it's a little bit loud on this road that I've decided to do this do this runcast on. Um, all right, so a little bit of dog opera. I don't know what's going on over there. Um, a little bit of news. Uh, the other day, in uh, they had a big awards show that I think is just the awards show they do every year by the Sport Authority of Thailand. And uh, they give out awards for, you know, best fighter of the year, best trainer of the year, best gym of the year, all this stuff. Um, but they also like added in this kind of like soft power element to it because the Thai government is really pushing this soft power of Muay Thai. Which again, I'm always talking about monkey's paws. This is good and bad. When the Thai government first announced that they were going to make Muay Thai a soft power, I thought that was great because it's a um, acceptance and inclusion of Muay Thai as a Thai identity by the government, which is great because in general Muay Thai is kind of seen as like dirty and low, like low class and maybe potentially a little bit like um, criminal. Uh, so for the government to take that on, that heightens it, that's very good and that means they'll invest more money in it. But then the like bad element of that is that you have people making very significant decisions who have absolutely nothing to do with actual promotion, production, practicing, and culture of Muay Thai. So you have like business people and politicians and, uh, you know, government officials making decisions about things that uh, really are in the interest of business more than in um, the interest of, you know, the culture of Muay Thai. Maybe I'll come back to that if I can remember. Um, well, I'll talk about it first and then I'll talk about these awards, I guess. There's something to me that's kind of uh, dubious. Suspicious makes it sound like you think something is necessarily bad, whereas I think actually suspicious is a little bit neutral where it just makes you question things. So dubious, I'm dubious about things. Uh, as Americans, I don't know why, because we have so much evidence to the contrary, but for some reason our culture as Americans, we really, really believe that people are selling what they appear to be selling. And they almost never are. Like, that's not actually what's being sold, ever. So, uh, I was, the reason I thought of this, so I was reading about how Bob Arum, who, for people who don't know, he's a huge promoter of uh, boxing in America, like, one of the biggest. Um, he had, like, I don't know if it was HBO or Showtime or whatever, but he had a huge TV contract. And he signed Mike Tyson to it, a young Mike Tyson. And uh, he ended up, stopping his contract with Mike Tyson because it was too hard to find opponents for him and because he kept knocking his opponents out too fast. And he's like, this doesn't work for broadcast TV because we're actually trying to sell ad time. Like, airtime is advertisement time. And it's too hard to keep finding him opponents because he wants to fight all the time. And then when he does fight, he knocks people out too fast and so we don't actually have, like, a full card. So what you're selling is advertising time. This is that, like, you're not actually selling what you appear to be selling. You're like, oh, that's bullshit. This guy sells boxing. He doesn't sell boxing. He promotes boxing, and boxing sells airtime. And this is the same thing with promotions. Like, one, one is not selling martial arts. One is selling media, essentially. In promotions of Muay Thai in Thailand, by promoting Muay Thai, they're not necessarily selling the, like, cultural history and legacy of Muay Thai. They are also selling airtime if it's televised. You know, they need uh, to fill the amount of time that they have on air. And then you look at who the sponsors are of most Muay Thai shows and they tend to be like medicines and agricultural equipment and stuff like that. So there's a thing, whenever we're looking at uh, what decisions are being made, what's being promoted, and like how it's being sold to you is what is actually being sold is not necessarily what appears to be being sold to you. And I think that kind of gets doubled down in this like who's making the decisions about the direction that Muay Thai is going to go or uh, how the heritage is going to be or whatever. These are not people who like want to curate museums. These are people who want to make money. These are people who um, are selling tourism essentially. And so by having the actual thing that you're selling with Muay Thai be tourism, you're going to fundamentally change or make decisions based on that rather than the decisions that would 
preserve or bolster or greatly help the endurance of Muay Thai. So people who are within the Muay Thai community uh, talk a lot about how the government should be pumping more money into um, sports schools. Siobhan talked about this, Tucker Leck talked about this, that by putting money into sports schools, which already exist, there are already sports schools all over Thailand, you can get a degree, it's basically like a physical education degree, uh, but you can specialize in something. So you can specialize in soccer or volleyball or baseball or whatever, and you can specialize in Muay Thai. Um, if they really pumped money into that, that would bolster gyms all around the country, promotions all around the country, that kind of thing. But that's very internal. So by having it be a soft power, by having a lot of your promotion be about soft power, that means you're actually selling tourism, um, which, you know, Thailand has a very weird identity crisis where they are very proud of their identity and their kindness and they're actually very insulated in this like inside outside thing. And as an immigrant in this country, it can be kind of painful at times how much you are just never fully on the inside, which is kind of understandable. There are cultural differences. Um, and I think that a lot of Westerners get kind of jaded about it and kind of pissed off about it. Is this like, uh, oh, they just want me as like a bank or whatever kind of thing. It's like, you never learned the language. <laughs> what do you want? Like, what do you want? You want people to like be super sick? They see you every time you come through the door and you don't even speak the language here. So I don't know, that's its own thing. Um, but the other side to the Thai identity is that they really, really love having face globally. So anything that draws attention to Thailand on a global stage in a positive light, they're all for. So like you could stomp all over traditional Thai dance, traditional food, traditional dance, whatever, as long as it's on an international stage, we fucking love it. This is one of the reasons that Samart and Somrock are like the biggest stars is because they brought face to Thailand on an international stage in boxing. Um, and so someone like Diesel Noy, who never did that on an international stage, he'll never reach the same degree of accolade and, and pride and all these different things because of how Thais feel about being seen on an international stage. So this is one of the things uh, to me that makes the popularity of one in Thailand very complicated is that a star like Stamp will be absolutely fucking loved because she has an international recognition. Bokao has international recognition and so he is like completely loved uh, for that reason. Um, whereas Stamp could be exactly what she is in Thailand, not on an international stage, and she would just be kind of like nothing. <laughs> she would not she would not be loved the way that she is. Um, and it kind of makes sense, like, I don't know. Uh, America does not really have that same duality of concepts. We're very used to everyone thinking that we're the greatest and we think we're the greatest. And like, of course you would want our culture because we spread it around so everything like hamburgers and pop music and all that stuff. Like it's not something that we ever have any insecurity about. So for me, it's a little bit uncomfortable. Like it's, it's odd for me to see. Um, but, so these awards, and this is very good, and this kind of comes back to it. So, uh, the fighter, the female fighter of the year was Som Ratsumi, which totally makes sense. She's the first Russian dominant female champion. She's two-time RWS champion uh, in two different weight classes. Like, totally makes sense for Som Ratsumi to be female fighter of the year. It's great. Uh, Sine John was amateur female fighter of the year. And uh, Thailand does have amateur Muay Thai. But it's not the way that amateur is the rest of the world with Muay Thai. Pro fighters fight amateur because they're amateur events and they're mostly like in schools and kind of like annual uh, sea games and then like the nationals and blah, 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 all this stuff. So the reason Sine John is an interesting pick to me is that she was kind of a rising star a number of years ago and she and Bokao, female Bokao, were the first female fight under the banner of Lumpany when Lumpany decided to let women fight at the stadium. The asterisk, unfortunately, with their history is that because it was during COVID, they hadn't opened the stadium up yet. And so they fought in a temporary stadium that was on top of the parking lot of Lumpany and never actually in the ring of Lumpany. So 
as a feminist, as a woman who always wanted to fight in Lumpany, who was barred from this when women weren't allowed to fight there, the important part is fighting in the ring of Lumpany, which is what you weren't allowed to touch, you weren't allowed to be near. So it's very important for the history to me, and I think overall, that the first female fight of Lumpany was two Thai women, Sine John and Wu Kao. Um, it's just this little asterisk that they never fought in the actual ring of Lumpany. The first two women to fight actually in the ring of Lumpany were Celeste Hansen and Nong Nook. Nong Nook is fucking amazing. I don't know if she got an award this year, but she really should. <laughs> She's incredible. I saw that there was a uh, female boxer of the year, like Western Boxing. But for Western Boxing, they use their real names. They don't use their play names um, and they don't use fight names. So I don't know who this person is because I don't know people's real names but it didn't look like Nong Nuke's name, so I don't know who this female boxer of the year is. But this is also an interesting point. Uh, so like, Chart Chai Sasakun, when he fought in Muay Thai, his name was Nung Torini. Nung is his play name, Torini is like land, so it's just, it's a beautiful fight name, but his name was Nung Torini. When Somra fought in Muay Thai, his name was uh, Himran Lek, and his older brother was Pimran. But when he went into boxing, he had to use his real name. So Somrak is his real name. Char Chai is Char Chai's real name. So this is why they're named these things when they go into boxing. In boxing, you use your real name. It's kind of interesting. Um, but so anyway, when I'm looking at these like awards, Pechi Ja got an award. So Pechi Ja was the female fighter of this thing. And Sexan was the male fighter of this thing. And I see this word. And I don't understand it, and I look it up in the dictionary, and it makes even less sense. It means like applied Muay Thai. I'm like, this doesn't make, I don't understand what this is. So I went and I asked Tapia, um, and it's Chung, which is like technique. Chung, Prayuk. And Prayuk means to like, it means to apply, but it means to adjust or to alter. And it took me a really long time listening to Tapia explain to me what this might mean for me to understand that it's the way that Kevin and I use the word modified Muay Thai. So anytime I fought in like three rounds or if they didn't let me use elbows or if I wasn't allowed to do whatever that makes it not real Muay Thai, on my record you'll see we wrote modified Muay Thai. So Sexan and Pechi Ja won awards for this adjusted or adapted technique of Muay Thai. And that's one, so they're fighting on one. So basically they've come up with a term to give these two people awards for modified Muay Thai fighter of the year. This is really interesting. If there is like a really big legal argument, so uh, this stuff is interesting to me. I'm sorry if this drags on. So the poor Pong Suwang gym existed in the golden age. They had really good fighters. They had Dork Mar Ba, they had, um, that Duong, they have their brother Dukaratong. It still exists. There are still fighters at this gym now, which is crazy. Like there are almost no golden age gyms that still exist now. But the head of that gym, Tartui, he tried to sue one, like legally, like bring a suit against them, saying that because they're not abiding by the Boxing Act, they can't call what they do Muay Thai. Legally to me, this makes sense because there's a Boxing Act that says you have to abide by these rules and everyone else does except entertainment Muay Thai. So when you have entertainment Muay Thai, which is like three rounds, modified rules, all this stuff, that doesn't have to abide by the Boxing Act because it's not real Muay Thai. It's not authentic Muay Thai. But one wanted to call itself real Muay Thai because that's how it sells itself. So Jartui brought a suit against them being like, well, if you're gonna call yourself Muay Thai, you have to abide by the same rules that everyone else abides by in order to do what it says in the rules. And ultimately the Thai government was like, no, no, this is making us money. We're gonna leave it. Like we're gonna let them call themselves Muay Thai and not have to go by the rules. Uh, and then Tucker Lek recently, uh, who I really like, he's in the Muay Thai library. I've talked about him before. He's a lawyer. Um, he was talking about how it's really important to actually clarify what you're talking about because now there are so many different kinds of Muay Thai it used to be that Lumpany and Rajadamnar, and this was standard, like these were the standard stadia. So whatever they did, everyone else had to do. If someone said something was a foul, they would talk about it with these refs, they would make it official and it would go across the entire country. And so everyone was doing the same Muay Thai. Now there's tons of different kinds of Muay Thai because of this entertainment 
Um, and then they also have one that's called like business Muay Thai. Um, so the reason this is interesting to me, the Peggy John Sexan won an award for this modified Muay Thai thing. Uh, my word is modified. It means like adjusted or adapted. Um, is that it is a step towards having slightly different wording for what you're actually talking about in order to divide that uh, Somrasami is fighter of the year of Muay Thai, because this is like standard, and then uh, Peji Ja is female you know, fighter of the year for this adjusted modified Muay Thai. One could argue that RWS is not really <laughs> traditional Muay Thai either, um, but it is much closer to traditional Muay Thai than what Peji Ja has been doing for the past years, because prior to entering one, she was fighting at Thai Fight, which is really a modified Muay Thai also. Um, so that's interesting, just the like, the, the news and the goings on and the like watching what's happening with these arguments and discussions and, and how things are being handled is really interesting to me um, because this is what's happening in Muay Thai, like this is what the, the like future uh, map or whatever what's happening with Muay Thai is going to be. Um, Last week, Kevin and I went to this non-televised show at Rush Domner. It was put on by Peng and D. And it was a really big deal because there's a rematch between Chon Chon and Duan Gao Gao, who had fought before, and people complained about the result. It's like this big thing. Chon Chon trains at Smart Paya Karun's gym, uh, and Duan Gao Gao is a kind of like gambler favorite type fighter. And so it's a five round fight real Muay Thai, all this stuff, and uh, the, when I was actually watching the fight, like I watched the fight on TV, I felt like Chalam Chan had lost that fight in round five, that he had kind of messed up and lost it in round five, so I didn't think the decision was bad, but people were very upset about the decision. Karahat helps train Chalam Chan, and he went online immediately and was like, we want a rematch, we'll put a million baht on it, blah blah blah, this thing, he was like immediate about it, which I think is really beautiful that he like went to that. Um, and like put his name on everything and was kind of like, make this happen now. There ended up being a lot of drama in terms of actually getting this fight to take place, but they did put a two million bot side bet on it, which ultimately got taken off because they kept moving it, blah, blah, blah. But Kevin and I went uh, to the show that had this fight on it. Uh, see about, I think he got the idea from his dad. I don't know if his dad necessarily gave him the idea or whether it was just from talking to his dad about the difference between the golden age and now. His father was a, a promoter in the golden age, Pet Um But in the golden age, you had to actually go to the stadium. Like there were fights on TV, but almost none. Like it was maybe once or twice a week and now it's all the time. So I think Sia Bo got the idea from talking to his dad that getting people to actually go, not broadcasting it, uh, on TV or online, you have to actually be there, is a way to kind of like drum up interest and sell tickets and really get more money at the gate and this kind of thing. And this proved to be true when we went to the one in August, that was like a huge success. With this one, they decided to stream it on an app called Pride TV, and you have to have a Thai phone number in order to download the app. So I think you can do this outside of Thailand as long as you have a Thai phone number. Um, but you can watch these when they do it on this app, Pride TV. Um, he said it was successful. He didn't give any numbers or anything, so I don't know. But he said it was successful in the app. It was a successful show, actually, going and watching it. It was really good. The Chalam Chan doing 99 fight was, like, so exciting. Uh, it was, to me, kind of this fight for the soul of Muay Thai. Because you've got these two sides one side, the like Chalam Chan side is arguing that like nobody cares about real technique anymore. He's trained by legends. He's at Samart's gym, so he has like Samart and Somrock and Karahat and Gontorni. He has like all these legends coming in and working with him, teaching him technique. It's kind of like the Muay Thai library, but actually working on an active fighter, like we're gonna make you able to do all these things. And then doing 99, he's more like my, he's like my size. He's really tiny. And he's really strong. They fight at like 105, 106 pounds. Like they're very little. Um, but Chalam Chalam's really tall. Doing 99's really small, but like stacked. And uh, he's what gamblers like. Like he just comes in and keeps swinging. So it's this, in terms of why I'm saying it's like a fight for the soul of Muay Thai is you've got the like gambler favorite 
And I don't think he's a bad fighter. Kevin was very secretly cheering for doing 99 because he's small and fighting bigger and had all these disadvantages. Um, but you know, not like golden age technique kind of thing. He doesn't have the kind of punches that like, uh, you know, Somrock or uh, John Tong, Samran Sok, like he's not a puncher like that, uh, but he is very powerful. So I think, I think the reality of Muay Thai now and kind of what it needs to be is somewhere in the middle. I don't think it should be this like technique wins over everything. I think power is real. I think effect is real. And I think gamblers are who's keeping a lot of the lifeblood in Muay Thai alive. And so you should not totally dismiss what they want to see and what they find interesting and what they believe in. But oh my God, this fight was a complete, complete blowout. <laughs> like it was, it was not close. And uh, doing 99 really had to go hard in round five. And if he had done that earlier, I think it would have been a different fight, but I don't know if he could have done that for like many rounds because he was going so hard. And then Shalom Chan had to basically just juggle him. It was very much, very much like classic Moi Mat, Moi Femur matchup from the golden age. Not at that level, but with the same kind of like, this is how this full Matador matches up. And it was really exciting and it was really great. I was really happy that we got to go watch it live. And then a couple days later was um, Kunsuk Lek, who was undefeated in 39 fights, which he's 18 years old. This means he hasn't lost in like six years or something. Um, and he was fighting Kumandoi, who recently, like in the past couple of years, was signed to Pet Yindi. They turned him into a boxer. They had him go fight for Asian titles in Japan. He was training with uh, Chartai Sasakun, who was also a Pet Yindi fighter, so he trains the Pet Yindi fighters now in boxing. He has amazing, uh, I don't mean technically amazing, I mean he really believes in his punches, like he just fucking swings a hundred percent all the time. And he was like this as a Muay Thai fighter, and so when we found out he was going to be trained by Chartai, Kevin were like, oh wow, he'll like rein him in and like really kind of get uh, his efficiency together and it'll be a beautiful thing. And you just, sometimes you just can't change people. Like when you're in a fight, you go back to what you know. And uh, so uh, Kunso Glek was kind of the challenger. This is for the Raja Domner title, which Kumandoi already had. And it was on RWS. So again, this is not like 100% pure Muay Thai, like a slightly adjusted in terms of how they score it. And Kunso Glek is like absolutely Karahat style femur. Like he is only femur. He's not like also other stuff. He's amazing. He's a twin. He has a brother, Kunso Gnoi, who's also incredible. Um, but Kunso Glek was undefeated in 39 fights. So we're watching this fight a couple days later on TV. And it's one of these things that like would have been amazing to see in person to actually go support that too. But man, it was like the same thing of like, uh, can, can Femur, which is gonna disappear uh, with the kind of way that entertainment Muay Thai is gaining traction. Muay Cao and Muay Femur are gonna disappear. But Kunso Glek's level of Femur was so amazing. And the way that he just kind of like made Kumandoi look mua, like look like he just couldn't even control himself for like four out of the five rounds was actually really incredible and really impressive. Um, so these were two very inspiring fights to me. Um, I don't think that the Chon Chon Duan 99 fight was even my favorite on that card. Uh, there was one earlier that, oh, I really, really like this fighter. Um, I'd never seen him before. He's from the South and, uh, he just, the way that he controls space was so beautiful. It's so exciting to me when I can see like skill. Uh, and they're not necessarily golden age skills. They're not like, oh, he's doing a thing that's like from this other time. It's like, he's doing a thing that made these fighters before so amazing, like made everyone in the nineties incredible because everyone had these skills. And then, you know, other people had like specialties in it. They like specialized in certain parts of it. So seeing that fight card and then seeing the fight on TV with Kunsu Glek and Kumandoi was really inspiring to me in terms of like seeing um, very, very good Muay Thai, and uh, even watching the the lower fights when we went into Rajdamer and like 
those Kevin and I kind of uh, we lived in Chiang Mai for two years, and so Top Pei Stadium is kind of the like standard stadium of the north. And um, they have good fights in there. Like it's, it's not a ridiculous stadium; it's a real stadium, and they have good fights. But the the level of fighting because it's people every single night, it's people who are local, this kind of thing. Like it's not these are not like super high level fights and so sometimes when we're watching something on RWS or something that's like oh this is like a really big in Bangkok on TV uh, fight and we're like this is not significantly better than Top Hay. like this is kind of a Top Hay fight but just being fought in a like more like esteemed area so it's really exciting to me to be watching those fights and be like these are not Top Hay fights like these are you can see that this is like a higher level of like a higher caliber of fighters and they're also not incredible like they're not like the same as like the best of the best in the golden age or even the best of the best now but the like this level like the basic level of everyone on that fight card was like these people are good like these people are like yes Bangkok is still a higher level of fighting than other places which I don't know it's interesting for me to see because I kind of see I see those lines bleeding a lot. Um, so that's my ramble. My hand now hurts from holding my selfie stick. So I'm going to get back to my run. Thanks for listening to my ramble.